So my patient is a 41 year old man with past medical history, um, nothing major. I uh, presented to an outside hospital with three weeks of headache, generalized weakness, shortness of breath and left-sided chest pain. His headache involves the whole head, it's fluctuating in severity, and he has reportedly no focal neurologic deficits. This is his initial uh, lab workup that shows a marked leukocytosis, anemia, thrombocytopenia. He got a peripheral smear that showed 94% blasts. His coag workup was uh, relatively normal, except for his D-dimer, which was elevated. Because of his headache, he got a CT head, which showed these multiple hyperdense lesions, three main and then several smaller. The outside radiologists were most concerned that this represented hemorrhagic metastases. He received fluids, platelets, Keppra, and was transferred to Duke's oncology service. He arrived with persistent headache, increased somnolence, but no focal deficits. Uh, he received leukapheresis, prednisone, and his white count did improve. Flow cytometry did reveal acute B-cell lymphoblastic leukemia. That was BCR able positive. So he was started on imatinib, which is the uh, TKI with the lowest risk of bleeding. His lumbar puncture showed no blasts in his CSF. The team first consulted neurosurgery, who recommended a repeat CT head. Um, this is actually the picture, for, uh, the pictures from our uh, institution, and our radiologist read this as being more consistent with a leukostasis um, rather than metastatic lesions. They also recommended an MRI and a platelet goal over 100. So this is his MRI scan. We're seeing multiple areas of susceptibility on the T2 and SWI sequences, uh, and this showed intermediate T1 signal surrounding vasogenic edema. These multifocal intracranial hemorrhages have uniform signal. They're in a predominantly uh, gray-white matter junction distribution. And the radiology here uh, suggested that this was um, consistent with like a diffuse intravascular coagulation DIC picture in addition to possible leukostasis. So neurology was consulted um, on day three. Uh, on our exam, this patient had mild weakness of his left upper extremity, mild diffuse hyperreflexia. Our impression was that these um, cortical and subcortical intracranial hemorrhages were most likely secondary to his thrombocytopenia and leukocytosis, causing impairment of hemostasis intravascularly and through uh, endovascular damage. However, given that he didn't have any hemorrhagic involvement of his other organs and such a large hemorrhage burden, we also had some concern that he had an underlying or leukemia-induced vasculopathy. So we recommended a CTA that showed normal vasculature, and then again, uh, recommended avoiding antiplatelets, anticoagulation, and transfusing above 75 for his platelets. So my learning point for this case was uh, trying to understand a little bit more about the um, pathophysiology behind multifocal hemorrhages in the setting of acute leukemias and found some studies suggesting that the marked leukocytosis causes a hyperviscosity, leukostasis, hypoxic vasodilation, and eventual rupture of small cerebral vessels. Another study showed that uh, looked at various types of cerebrovascular disease as complication of acute leukemia and did um, autopsy studies. And they found that in patients who had coagulopathies like the DIC, thrombocytopenia, they were more likely to see a large hemorrhage with um, several uh, micro hemorrhages, but in patients with a marked leukocytosis leading to leukemic cell infiltration, they uh, were more likely to see multiple hemorrhages as in our patient. Um, they found that microscopically, the hemorrhagic lesions consisted of leukemic cell nodules surrounded by numerous red blood cells. For a patient, um, regardless of which one of these two factors is um, more responsible for his uh, hemorrhages, treatment is the same, leukophoresis and platelet transfusion and eventual chemotherapy. And these studies show that patients are expected to regain pretty normal neurologic function. And indeed, that's what happened for our patient. His headache and somnolence resolved. And on a CT scan follow-up at two weeks, he had no new hemorrhages, just some evolving encephalomalacia. He was discharged 25 days later uh, as platelet count did recover after receiving 29 units of platelets. Uh, he uh, left on imatinib and prednisone and the team planned for systemic chemotherapy. All right, thank you. Let me see, I gotta share my screen. Thank you, Jordan. Lynn, the residents are so smart these days, aren't they? They certainly are. That was a fascinating case. Well Thank done. You. So uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Alrighty. So it's, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to do, introduce uh, Dr. Lynn Raymond. Lynn and I have known each other a long time. Uh, she's currently the director of the David 
I won't even try. How do you pronounce that, Lynn? Moafagian. Moafagian Center for Brain Health and the Louise Brown Chair of Neuroscience. Uh, she is also the past president of the Canadian Society for Neuroscience. Uh, congratulations. Uh, she did her MD PhD at Albert Einstein and her residency at Johns Hopkins, where she ran into a very angry first year neurology resident named Rich O'Brien. And uh, she was my uh, chief resident, uh, my second chief resident, the first one I detested and made me feel bad about having gone into neurology. And when Lynn came in, things became uh, fun and enjoyable and intellectual. She was such a, a calm and a superb doctor. Nothing would faze her, even me and my antics in those days. And uh, I've been eternally grateful for that. Uh, we then met, Lynn led the way into Rick Huguenier's lab, uh, studying glutamate, glutamate receptor physiology. And I joined probably a couple of years after that. And she's remained uh, uh, in that field, studying how uh, glutamate, NMDA, and AMP receptors contribute to disease pathogenesis and diseases such as Huntington's disease, and is one of the world leaders combining what I think is a very difficult career, which is clinical work and uh, electrophysiology. Uh, and we're incredibly pleased to have her today uh, doing grand rounds. I wish it was in person, but um, we'll take whatever we can get. And the title of uh, Lynn's talk is The Mechanisms of Altered Synaptic and Circuit Function in Huntington's Disease. It's all yours, Lynn. Hey. Can you see that? It's coming. There it is. We got it. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Rich, for inviting me uh, to Grand Rounds at Duke. I wish I were there, but um, hopefully next time. And thanks for that kind introduction. Um, so I'm gonna keep the electrophysiology as understandable as possible, but I do have to present some. Um, and uh, I'm gonna start with uh, my, oops, let me click on the slide anymore. Disclosures, uh, the ones on top are ones for which I'm paid. They're not relevant except for the fundamental pharma I'll mention later. Uh, and volunteer. Um, the objectives of my talk were to first review clinical features and therapeutic trials in Huntington disease, then describe use of mouse models to understand cortical striatal synaptic and circuit function in HD, especially the role of NMDA type glutamate receptors, and then introduce a newly developed platform for measuring striatal activity that correlates with motor learning in HD mouse models. So Huntington disease is caused by uh, a trinucleotide expansion in the HD gene. So repeats of uh, CAG greater than 39, the longer the repeat, the earlier the age of onset. The protein encoded is Huntington. It's expressed in most cells and organs, but results in a selective neurodegeneration uh, that involves, let me get my cursor up here. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to do that. Uh, oh. Uh, yeah, that, that didn't work. Back to slideshow. Okay. So, I can get a um, laser pointer for option. There we go. Okay. Moving on, um, selective neurodegeneration. And so it involves most severely the caudate and cutamen nuclei in the stratum, but uh, all gray and white matter of the cortex as well as atrophy in later stages. And, and we know that um, cortical striatal basal ganglia thalamic loops are involved uh, in regulating movement, cognition, and emotion. And these are the areas of the cortex and stratum that are involved. Uh, and, and most severely affected in Huntington disease, all, all of these. Um, and it results in a clinical triad, behavioral changes, especially depression and anxiety, a movement disorder that is both in involuntary movement, especially chorea, and I'll show you uh, an example, um, 
and as well as in coordination of voluntary movements such as fine motor coordination, um, gait uh, imbalance and, and, uh, and coordination, as well as uh, affecting speech and swallowing. Then cognitive deficits are, uh, include frontal executive function, which is impaired quite early. The prevalence in North America is about one in 10,000, but uh, in Venezuela, Mar Lake Maracaibo, it's one in 100. And that's where a group uh, of uh, gene hunters, they call themselves, Jim Gazella, Nancy Wexler, and Ann Young, studied a population that um, to, to understand, uh, define the gene, basically. Um, it looks like I'm not able to play this. Uh, it was showing the Korea and, and the prevalence of this disease in uh, Lake Maracaibo. I think I'll just move on. Um, so why study Huntington disease? Uh, to, to look at mechanisms of neurodegeneration and potentially find treatments when Alzheimer and Parkinson's are, are a lot more common. But with Huntington disease, we have uh, the advantage um, in terms of understanding the, uh, what leads up to uh, disease onset that people can be uh, tested at the age of 18, the age of consent. Uh, they can undergo predictive genetic testing, find out if they carry the gene expansion and join studies where we can follow them prospectively. So this was a landmark study published in 2020 from Sarah Tabrizi's group in the UK looking at a cohort of young adult gene expansion carriers who by all measures, all clinical measures, cognitive, motor, neuropsychiatric appeared normal. Um, and on average were about 24 years before estimated motor onset, which is uh, predicted by the CAG repeat and their current age. Um, as well, when she looked at CSF and protein and plasma biomarkers, most of those were normal uh, as well as volumetric MRI except for um, putamen, which showed a, a significant 4% reduction, uh, as well as in the CSF and plasma, an elevation of neurofilament light chain. So uh, of course, that's a nonspecific marker of neurodegeneration, um, yet it's, it can be quite useful for, for Huntington disease. Because if you look at this plot here uh, in the red box um, of CSF neurofilament light chain levels, uh, for different CAG repeats, 40 is here, 45 is here, and on the x-axis we have the age, hard to read here, but if you look at the arrow that's associated with the 45 uh, CAG repeat, um, the neurofilament light chain in CSF is elevated significantly above an age match control sample at the age of about, say, 23. Um, and this arrow over here tells you when, uh, on average, uh, there is motor onset. So it's, it's almost 20 years before, and, and it progresses over, over um, the disease course. So this could be a useful marker for the prodromal phase, um, as can uh, the volume in the stratum uh, measured by uh, MRI, which shows a, a start a steep decline more than, or yeah, more than 15 years prior to this dotted line, which is the uh, motor diagnosis of Huntington disease. Um, and here's the neurofilament light chain going up. Um, before the motor diagnosis, there is an accumulation of subtle uh, motor abnormalities, as well as cognitive deficits. So this is uh, just before the onset. This is a window of opportunity where if we understood what the mechanisms are uh, causing the degeneration, we might be able to slow it down and delay onset. So with, um, with that in mind, animal models are useful, but before I talk about them, I, I just wanted to briefly touch on Huntington lowering therapy. This is obviously the, um, the home run, if we can get it to work. Um, three different approaches have already uh, been uh, um, trialed in the clinic. Uh, the antisense oligonucleotide injection into spinal fluid with a LP, um, the Roche study was uh, stopped because of worsening manifest HD in the group that had the highest dose. It may restart at a lower dose um, soon, as well as the WAVE study that uh, attempted to target specifically mutant Huntington um, with uh, targeting uh, SNPs 
actually failed to lower Huntington in the CSF. So that was stopped. They have a new one that they're trying that, that may be working better. Um, and then if, if we want to just uh, more directly knock down um, the RNA, uh, we can use microRNAs or siRNAs. Unicure is using a microRNA, and that was temporarily halted for safety concerns. Um, requires about a, a more than 12 hour uh, surgery to do that injection. And then oral lowering agents, which would be spectacular as, as the administration is easy. Novartis halted for safety concerns. PTC, the pivot HD is ongoing. So these are very early stage, um, promising, but uh, lots of work to be done. As well, um, there's a limited distribution of the agent, unless you're talking about the oral agents. ASO would be mainly cortex. Um, when, when miRNA is injected to striatum, it's obviously mainly striatum. Um, and yet both cortex and striatum are, are um, affected uh, early in Huntington disease. So uh, there's also complexity of administration and risk. As well, uh, a mouse study showed um, that that early, if um, mutant Huntington is expressed through the course of development and then uh, then turned off, basically, there's still long-term synaptic changes. So we may need to find uh, other uh, targets to, um, to, to, to treat to complement therapy uh, of lowering Huntington, unless we're going to start lowering it um, at birth, basically, or, or there's a CRISPR technology. So I'm going to leave that for now. You can ask me questions later if you like. Um, going to animal models, uh, our, our lab uh, has been using YAC-128. So that's yeast artificial chromosome carrying the human genomic DNA uh, for Huntington with 128 repeats. So of course, that would be um, early juvenile onset, but this is what you need to see um, progression of a Huntington disease phenotype over months that, that we see in years in human. Uh, this isn't human onset at 10 years of age, but um, that at 15 years into the changes that occur that I've mentioned, that's where the diagnosis occurs and uh, it progresses from there. One thing we don't see in the mites is as much striatal neuronal loss as we do in humans. It, it really only gets to about 13%. In human at the end stage, 95% uh, of the medium sized spiny neurons are lost in the striatum. This is a very busy slide uh, showing that with mouse models, many mechanisms uh, have been identified to be impacted by mutant Huntington, cellular mechanisms in neurons. We've talked about Huntington lowering as, as being the obvious one, but proximal, very proximal to mutant Huntington is. Um, uh, dysregulation of calcium signaling in the in the cell, especially at the level of the endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria. And a SIGMA-1 receptor agonist called protopidine um, targets that and, and normalizes it, at least in the mouse models. It's now in a phase three study proof HD. Uh, as well, neuroinflammation is thought to contribute to the damage in Huntington disease as, it, as in other neurodegenerative disorders. And two studies have uh, targeted that mechanism, the Quinimod and the Pinimab uh, study just was published. Um, and both show a slowing of atrophy of the cortex in particular, but the clinical outcome measures uh, were not met, um, which were mainly uh, striatal based, uh, the movement disorder. Um, and so it, it may be that these are protective more at the level of the cortex and further studies will be done in this regard. We have focused at the synaptic level. There are many changes that occur at synapses quite early. Our lab, uh, Mike Levine at UCLA, um, Jim Surmeyer, uh, and others have, have shown these changes in the mice. Uh, and so with that, that's what I will focus on in this talk. Um, this is a diagram just to remind you of the areas that are most affected in Huntington disease and within the striatum, it's GABAergic medium-sized spiny neurons, again, that are severely affected early and, uh, and to, to the, uh, about 95% loss later in the disease. This is a reminder of the, the motor circuit. Um, so our lab is focused on the um, synapse between the, the motor areas of the cortex and dorsal striatum.
that regulate movement. And at that synapse, um, we've looked at the NMDA type glutamate receptors on the steroidal neurons. So uh, why NMDA receptors? This is um, the results of a proteomic study from uh, William Yang's lab at UCLA, um, showing all of the different proteins that interact with Huntington, uh, the relationships on the postsynaptic side. One of the interaction hubs is GRIN2B, which is the gene encoding GLUN2B subunit of NMDA receptors. And um, it, it, this, this is a cartoon just to show that of course, most NMDA receptors occur, or are expressed at synapses, where the GUN2A subunit predominates. Both 2A and 2B are in cortex and striatum. At, and, and the signaling, the calcium signaling through those receptors is very important for activating transcription involved with neuronal survival, say brain-derived neurotrophic factor, as well as synaptic plasticity. On the other hand, extrasynaptic NMDA receptors that are on dendrites but not at synapses uh, have a glun to be um, predominant uh, subunit composition. And the calcium here is, is thought to inhibit those survival transcription pathways and um, plasticity, as well as um, causing uh, damage at the level of mitochondria and activating cell death pathways. And it's thought that synaptic hypoactivity or extrasynaptic hyperactivity or death promoting in a model that was first proposed by Giles Hardingham and Homer Potting, and that the balance between these two populations determines neuronal fate. So uh, now about uh, more than 10 years ago, our lab uh, published the first uh, evidence in a mouse model, the YAC-128 model, um, that very early at the time of weaning, three to four weeks of age, if we uh, look at brain slices from these mice, and we use patch clamp recording to measure excitatory uh, glutamate transmission onto striatal neurons uh, from cortical orthalamic uh, afferents. Um, what we found was if we, if we don't stimulate any glutamate release and we just look at spontaneous release, so very small amounts of glutamate onto the synaptic receptors, we could isolate some NMDA current shown in red here uh, by comparing with and without the inhibitor, AP5, and in low magnesium. And that was very similar between YAK18, which was our control, or wild, we also use wild type uh, mice as controls, and the YAK128. But as we stimulated glutamate release uh, and increased the intensity of the uh, current driving that release, as well as carrying pulses, we started to see a separation and blue is the YAK128 and uh, it became uh, larger than the YAK128, uh, the YAK18, I'm sorry. Uh, to confirm that we use the drug DLT-DOA. So what that does is block glutamate uptake, mainly by the uh, astrocytes that surround synapses shown in bold here, to allow spillover of glutamate that should promote it to extrasynaptic sites. So the black um, shown is without TBOA, and the, the colored traces are after TBOA. Uh, and the YAK128 shows a slower decay back to baseline, meaning that there's more uh, activation of NMDA receptors and they're asynchronous. So you get some synaptic activation and then the extrasynaptic, and there is a significant difference in the charge carried by NMDA receptors in the HD model suggesting more extrasynaptic receptors. And this was found in other labs and in other mouse models of, of Huntington disease. Um, as well, we were able to, if we treated to block the 2B type receptors with ifentadyl first, and then added to the OA, we did not see this difference in the amount of current carry. So they seem to be 2B type NMDA receptors. Uh, we could also see this by Western blot. I'm not showing you that data. So this was um, a, a, an effect that we saw quite early, again, at one month of age, when um, the, the diagram I showed you earlier was Rotorod uh, would be affected at perhaps four months of age. Um, so what's happening downstream of those receptors? Well, this is a diagram just showing in black here. You probably can't see it well, but all of the, um, the signaling pathways activated by synaptic, uh, and in black here, the extrasynaptic one. So, we focused on phosphocreb, which uh, is a, a regulator of uh, pro-survival 
transcription in, in the nucleus uh, and um, phospho P38, P38 map kinase, which uh, is linked to cell death and stress pathways. Um, and, uh, and, and this was reduced, this was elevated in steroidal tissue from one month animals, indicating that there was an, uh, an imbalance of synaptic and extrasynaptic activity. So to see uh, what impact that had on, on the animal's behavior and, uh, and whether or not this was really linked to extrasynaptic receptors, we used the drug memantine. So you may be familiar with that in Alzheimer disease um, where it's a treatment. And this is um, used at quite low dose. The, the dose we use in mice would be about five milligrams a day in human. And in, when we did that for two months, we were able to um, normalize the PCREB, P38 map kinase um, activity in, in the stratum as well. Um, somewhat surprisingly, we, we reduced back to wild type levels, the extrasynaptic and the receptor expression. So by blocking its function and uh, restoring its downstream signaling to uh, normal, um, we actually reduce those receptors. So there's some kind of feedback loop, which we'll come back to. Did this have any impact on the animal's behavior? We use the classic rotor rod test. This is um, a fixed speed, 24 RPM. We, keep the, we wanna keep the mouse on for two minutes. Um, and record how many times it falls in that period of time. So the white is the white is the wild type. It um, falls off uh, on average once until before learning uh, over these trials. The ACT 128 takes much longer to learn to stay on. After treatment with memantine shown in bold, it uh, looks more like wild type for very, very quickly learning at uh, three trials. What about straight uh, neurodegeneration? This was done in the Haven and um, labs and collaborating with Stuart Lipton's lab. They compared one milligram uh, per kilogram, a low dose with a higher dose, which would now um, it block also synaptic receptors and found that um, untreated yak mice in blue here show the significant straight degeneration at 12 months of age which is rescued in green by low dose memantine uh, and is actually worse if you use the higher dose. So when we uh, block both pathways. So it is truly this, the balance between them that, um, that helps determine normal uh, health. Um, so we showed in different ways that there were more extrasynaptic receptors in striatal tissue in the mice but we wanted to visualize this and see how early it occurred. So we turned to uh, cultures. Here we're culturing um, from embryonic mice, either wild type mice or YAC128, uh, um, and, and combining cortical and striatal neurons. We identify the striatal neurons uh, in culture three weeks later because we've transfected them with the GFP tagged LUNGB um, uh, of the NMD receptors. And, um, and then we can also use this tag flu NGB, which is tagged with the N-terminus, to, um, to, to actually stain for uh, surface flu NGB type receptors um, before permeabilizing cells, and then permeabilize and look at the internal in red. So green is the surface, red is the internal, and we can look at the ratio of that uh, to see how much um, excess surface expression of TB we have, and that was uh, almost, it was more than twofold higher in the yak and gray than the wild type for 2B, but there was no difference for 2A. And this increase in 2B receptors did not occur at synapses. It was because there was a similar um, co-localization with the marker of synapses of V group one. So now we have um, a platform where we can actually test mechanisms. How, how is the trafficking of NMD receptors affected by Newton Huntington? And I won't be able to go into um, some of the uh, work we've done in that area. But just to say that, again, if we added memantine to the culture medium for seven days, um, it, that we were able to normalize this, this ratio back to wild type levels. So again, memantine, by blocking the, the function of the receptors, also um, it causes a rebalance of receptor expression. So. Uh, why aren't we studying, <laughs> doing clinical trials of memantine and 
some uh, first first the first one here is just in mice again to show that uh, on a more systems level using MRI in the study they found uh, restoration of uh, circuit connectivity and I can't tell you any more about uh, exactly what they found. Um, and then there are three open label studies that were quite small that, that looked promising. But there seems to be uh, you know, um, not much appetite for studying this uh, further in a randomized clinical trial, uh, mainly because I think it's, it's relatively nonspecific. It does hit other ion channels. So we wondered, is there another approach to reduce extrasynaptic and receptor activity in Huntington's? And we found this uh, study uh, just a few years ago showing that activin A, which is a member of the transforming growth factor family, so it does many other things, um, but its transcription is nuclear calcium dependent and upregulated by uh, activity of synaptic NMDA receptors. Um, and it, it was found in the study that um, it's in, an increase in activin A could reduce toxic extrasynaptic NMDA receptor signaling in the hippocampus in a stroke model. So here it shows that their, their cartoon shows um, calcium through synaptic NMDA receptors, activates this neuroprotective gene program that then inhibits any um, activation of extrasynaptic NMDA receptors, which would occur during ischemia when there's um, a massive re uh, release of the unit. What they also noticed was that enhanced, by the same token, enhanced NMDA receptor activity extrasynaptic could decrease activin A levels. So we asked the question, is there a role for this uh, activin A in the altered extrasynaptic NMDA surface expression? And we again went to, so, so can it downregulate numbers of extrasynaptic receptors? Um, and is activin A secretion altered in, in Huntington disease? So we went back to our cultures. It's just an easier platform. Uh, and with an ELISA assay, and we found that at um, day four in vitro of uh, these corticosteroidal cultures, the active NA levels were actually fairly similar between wild type and uh, yak, and we normalized each culture batch to the levels at that stage, and then um, sampled over time. And you can see that there's a reduced uh, release of active NA in the yak 128 cultures. So then uh, using um, an A, B uh, construct, the, uh, could overexpress active A in these cultures versus a control um, construct uh, shown on the left here. We, we looked at the surface to internal ratios of uh, NMDA or 2B type NMDA receptors, looking at green um, for surface and blue as internal. And again, if we in the sham or control treated, the AC128 were much higher, that showed a much higher ratio than the wild type. And then that was uh, normalized wild type levels when activin A was overexpressed. So this is just you're confirming what was found in the hippocampus, but actually showing that it, it not only reduces the activity of, of those receptors or the calcium influx through them, but it, it can reduce the numbers back to normal levels in the Huntington model. So can it uh, actually have an impact in vivo if we, if we overexpress it in the striatum? We looked at um, motor learning, the expression of extrasynaptic NMDA receptors, and a marker of neural health. So before I show you those outcomes, what we were doing was stereotaxically injecting uh, AAV with active A or um, a control AAV into uh, bilaterally into the striatum. We used one, one microliter in subsequent experiments. And oops, um, looked at rotor rod training, as well as afterwards um, electrophysiology and brain slice and Western blot. The Western blot was to look at DARP32. So that's dopamine and uh, cyclic NQ uh, phosphoprotein regulated phosphoprotein. It's highly enriched in the striatum and in Huntington disease in the mice and in patients, what we see is uh, a downregulation as the disease progresses. Um, so we can see that in the untreated yak one and wild type, there's a difference in uh, normalized to beta actin in the DARP32. It's, it's reduced in the yak one and restored 
when we overexpress active amelium and stratum. And this is the pool data. This is just a reminder that actually secretion, at least in the cultures, is reduced. So now, presumably, we're normalizing or over expressing it. Um, and that can uh, rescue a marker of neuronal health for curvature. What about the rotor rod? So this one, um, a little bit different test, over th three trials a day for four days on an accelerating rotor rod going from five to 40 RPM. So if they can, uh, if they can stay on, the rotor rod gets to 40 RPM and the maximum time on the rotor rod is 300 seconds. So you can see that they all start at, at day one, they're having trouble staying on, only on average you know, a little less than 100 seconds, but they all, uh, the, the wild types in black and green are learning fairly rapidly and achieving almost the maximum uh, results at the end of four days. Interestingly, well, of course, the Act 128 at this age is not very good at the task in both males and females. It's significantly different from the wild type. But when active is overexpressed in these mice, they're um, pretty much uh, uh, um, the same as wild type as shown here. We recorded also from brain slice to look at whether or not extrasynaptic NMD receptor current was, um, was also normalized. And uh, this is an example of the traces we found. So we did, uh, first we recorded from the cell with no TDOA and then we added TDOA. So if you look at the wild type trace, the black is without TDOA. We're giving a train of 10 pulses at 20 hertz to sort of maximize glutamate uh, release. And after TBOA, you can see a much more, a, a slowing of the decay as we activate extrasynaptic receptors. In the AC128, uh, we have a bigger response that decays much more slowly with TBOA, I'm not showing before TBOA, but the ones treated with activin A actually decay at a similar rate to the wild type. Um, this is just showing the area um, under the, the tenth peak normalized to the tenth peak. So if we have a larger current, um, we're really not counting that. We're just looking at um, this, the area under the curve of the slope. Okay. So you can see that the active and A-treated ones now look the same as wild type. So we've what we've done is we've normalized extrasynaptic and receptor expression. Um, restored a marker of neuronal health, DARK32, and um, rescued uh, motor learning on the rotor rod with active MA. But unfortunately, that's, that's not an easy treatment. We have to change it, it, its expression, probably a genetic um, manipulation. It also does a number of other things, um, so, so it's not uh, the right target. And we wondered, uh, since we know that by increasing its expression, we can reduce the function here and eventually the expression of those receptors. And in fact, the activation of those receptors reduces active A, and we saw that in the cultures. Um, how can we, um, it, well, we hypothesize that really if we chronically inhibit those receptors, either by increasing active A or blocking them with memantine, that we could lead to a long-term, uh, that would lead to a long-term reduction in extrasynaptic re receptor expression and function. Is there a small molecule that we could use to, to target this, this downstream pathway or receptors and, uh, and, and, and normalize? So this is a paper that came out just two years ago from the Botting Lab, uh, and it, I think it's quite exciting, showing for the first time that NMDA receptors actually are coupled to the trip m 4 uh, um, receptors. And, and that's the transient receptor potential cation channel subfamily and member four. That's a mouthful, but um, it, it only is expressed at extrasynaptic sites, not synaptic. So it, it binds only to extrasynaptic and VA receptors, which when, the, when they have calcium influx will gate this channel open. It responds to increases in intracellular calcium to allow flux of sodium and, and potassium to depolarize uh, neurons. Um, and the idea was, so, so that the, the hypothesis they had was it's really this, this linkage that is mediating the downstream uh, effects on mitochondria, neural degeneration, and ischemic damage and stroke. 
And if they could uncouple these two receptors that maybe calcium flux through these NMDA receptors, despite the fact they're extrasynaptic, would not have these, uh, that impact. And, and they screened compounds, found one called compound eight, and this is its chemical uh, formula. And when they were able to uncouple with this compound in a stroke model in, in mice, they found restoration of mitochondrial function, no neural degeneration, or, or very little and very small uh, skin of damage. So it protects against cell death, and they found that in vitro as well. And they also uh, showed in that paper that it eliminated the extrasynaptic NMDA receptor shutoff of the survival and plasticity associated transcription. So it restored phosphocred and active MA levels um, to, to normal in, during uh, the stroke model. So we wondered, could the C8 compound reduce extrasynaptic NMDA receptor activity and expression if we give it chronically? They, they, in their paper, they treating um, acutely, it had no impact <clears throat> on channel function, sorry, <clears throat> of NMDA receptors. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but our hypothesis was that if we treat long enough <clears throat> and we're reducing this downstream um, toxic signaling, that maybe it would, would normalize these receptors. We used a different mouse model used by our collaborators, the Malkin one, um, and treated for eight weeks as we have done with Memantine, who recorded from striatal neurons and slice, um, and the, the collaborators in the botting lab tested effects on rotorod and other measures of striatal neuron health, and I won't present their data. Um, so in, in our hands in the slice after treatment, we saw the same effect as with active NA or with memantine. Here's the untreated YAC128 and the, um, the lighter uh, green is treated, sorry, Q175, the, the Nalkin model. It's also a Huntington disease model that was normalized to wild type levels after the uh, eight week treatment. So, uh, and, and the, uh, the rotor rod was also improved as was uh, marker associated and normal health um, data from the body lab. So basically in summary, before I, I finish up with another topic, um, I've shown you that extrasynaptic NMDA receptors are upregulated and can drive reduced survival signaling in HD striatal neurons. Uh, we can, if we inhibit them by low dose memantine or reduce uh, the downstream toxic signaling by enhanced expression of actin A or uncoupling from TRIP-M4 using C8 to uh, normalize the downstream signaling, um, we can improve uh, striatal survival signaling, skilled motor learning, and also normalize this extrasynaptic receptor expression. So um, this gets back to my uh, disclosures. I am a consultant for Fundamental Pharma. That company is a startup um, that has uh, modified, looking at um, analogs of C8 to find something more potent that might be moved to the clinic for a trial. And I think that's very exciting as potentially neuroprotective and or even um, uh, helpful for uh, motor, motor learning and motor symptoms. I, I have to em emphasize though, that we really need to look at that window that I mentioned at the beginning before we, the, a patient gets a diagnosis. Um, at that point, it may be too late to, to intervene at, at this level and, and other compensatory pathways have occurred uh, and, and basically the horse is out of the barn. So um, again, this disease is, is unique in, in the way that we can target um, uh, individuals who carry the, the gene uh, expansion, um, but are not yet affected. Uh, the last thing I'll do is just remind you that there are many papers showing altered cortical synaptic function occurs early. These, uh, this has been shown uh, in brain slides, normal culture, and um, in vivo in the mouse models. Um, these are just a few of the papers and it's not all about NMDA. Um, so how can we look at whether this altered cortical serial co connectivity um, that we've mostly looked at ex vivo, it, whether it impacts motor learning or Huntington's or how it does, uh, presumably it would. 
Um, so this is, uh, I'm just, these are my last couple of slides, a talented uh, PhD student in my lab, Ellen Koch, uh, did a series of experiments where she injected GCAP7F, uh, which is a genetically encoded calcium indicator, um, and it and measures dynamic levels of calcium in neurons as a proxy for neuronal excitation. She injected dorsal lateral striatum on, on the right and put uh, uh, an optic fiber in as well. So she could look at the fluorescence uh, in real time while mice were performing uh, the rotor rod task. Again, accelerating rotor rod, three trials a day for four days, you can see the learning. You can see that at two to three months of age, the YAC-138 are identical to the, the wild type in terms of latency to fall and the learning curve. When she looked at the um, striatal activity, I know this, this looks a, a bit noisy and it's, it's hard to see the pattern. So basically what she saw, this is the baseline five minutes before we put on the rotor rod, they stay on for, for this period of time and the red box on day one, you can see that the average uh, calcium activity is elevated compared to baseline. But by day four, that elevation is quite transient. And then uh, for most of the time on the rotor rod, it's no different from baseline. So when they become more proficient at the task, uh, latency to fall shown in light gray improves, they actually show um, on average a lower level of uh, calcium activation uh, in the stratum. Um, and that's a very strong inverse correlation for wild type mice. Interestingly, even though the app seemed to be performing the same way, they didn't show the same correlation. It, it was uh, inversely correlated, but not robustly like it was in the wild type. So we're already seeing a difference in how the stradal circuit is performing uh, during the rotor rod motor learning task. And this was more obvious at six to seven months of age, um, just showing you some summary data. They are much worse at uh, learning the rotor rod task. Um, in fact, some of them, she separated them into two groups, couldn't really perform it all, fell off almost immediately. So she only looked at ones that stayed on for a period of time, still less than wild type um, to look at stradal activity and it was elevated. So as if they never became proficient until day four, it seemed to get close to the wild type. Um, so, so there's clear differences we can see using this, uh, this, this platform that may help us to, um, to study uh, drugs that target circuit mechanisms. And I'm going to finish with just showing you that we can um, be more quantitative about analyzing motor coordination behavior in these uh, younger mice. So this is the two to three month of age where they stay on just as long as wild type. But when we uh, use Deep Lab Cut, a software uh, algorithm that can uh, use markerless tracking to look at where the paws are relative to the rotor rod shown with the red dots, um, the, the, uh, the steps become larger as the rotor rod accelerates over time, shown here. And uh, there are some deviations below the rotor rod, which we call paw slips. And there are significantly more, more paw slips uh, at every um, day, especially day three, in the act mice than in the wild type. Interestingly, despite the fact that they stay on and when we look at stridal activity around those phospholips shown with the dotted line here, um, the pattern looks quite different. And I'll just focus more on the later stage when there are a lot more phospholips for the app. The, the wild type at this point, it's as though they're anticipating or the stratum's anticipating the phospholip. There's an elevation of calcium activity that stays on uh, for a period afterwards and then falls back to baseline and no response in the stratum uh, for the app. So there are clearly differences, again, in the way the stratum uh, is um, activated during this learning task. And there may be uh, already deficits there that are compensated um, by, by other areas of the brain that were not encoding them. So those results could, uh, they definitely increase our understanding of how stratal activity is changing with motor learning and could improve testing therapeutics in these preclinical trials that target synaptic and circuit function. And this was uh, published just uh, three months ago in the research journal. So with that, I'm, I'll finish and uh, take questions. And red are the 
people in my lab who contributed uh, present and past to some of the work I've shown and the funding agencies. And this is the beautiful building where we work um, in, uh, at DBC in Vancouver. I'll take any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. Um, beautiful work, a beautiful building. Uh, is Vancouver a nice place to live? Oh, it's lovely. I thought I'd just come for a few years when I was recruited and um, yeah, it's hard to leave once you're here. So uh, I can start. Anyone with a question, either put your name or the question in the chat box and we'll call on you. Uh, you know, in the Alzheimer's world, our mouse model is a piece of crap. Uh, so we always look to Huntington's as the mouse model that we'll learn from uh, because it seems so like the, the real disease. But what do you think the pitfalls of looking for an answer and if, if you just kind of change your perspective from optimist to cynic of looking for answers in a mouse to a human disease? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I guess it, for Huntington disease, the, the lowering therapies were first tested in, um, in the mouse model. In fact, it started with way back in 2000 when um, I Yamamoto turned off the Huntington um, uh, gene in the R6-2 model and showed uh, um, a reversion to uh, more normal behavior, lost uh, the inclusions that were in the brain were disappeared. So in that sense, you know, but that's that's very proximal to- and I was gonna the, say, yeah. you're yeah. several steps down the pathway. Yeah, so um, yeah, has any other drug um, that we've tested in Huntington uh, mouse models? Well, obviously we don't have anything that's worked in the clinic. So we don't, it, we can't say. Um, I would. I would say that one of the problems is the stage where we're testing, which is always after the diagnosis. Kate and I showed you what's happening for, for 15 to 20 years before that. And what we're doing in mouse models is always quite early. We're not, but we're not could, adding drug after, after you the could, You could, for instance, look at uh, downstream molecules based on the model that you have or metabolites and see if you can sh see changes of those in spinal fluid or brain and human samples? Right, no, that's a, that's a great question. And um, they've looked at SV2A, for example, in PET, and, uh, and I think there's a, there's a synaptic marker they've looked for it's in CSF. And neither of those show changes that are uh, very obvious in, in patients. Um, so, you know, whether a synaptic marker would end up in the CSF um, because synapses are dysfunctional early, I, I don't know. It, it becomes really difficult. If, you, if you're not targeting Huntington, anything else, um, how do you measure target engagement um, when, when you're testing, you know, when you're doing a clinical trial? All right, uh, Len, you had a question? Yes. Comment? Len White? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Raymond, for being with us, particularly at an early hour, uh, Vancouver time. Um, I, I'm very glad that you talked about the extrasynaptic NMDA receptors, and I did not know about the coupling with the, the TRIP-M4 channels. I'm just wondering if you uh, could tell us about what impacts, either on behavior or specifically motor function, um, uncoupling has on the control mice. Right. Um, so. <laughs> Interestingly, our, um, our collaborators, when they did the rotorod testing with the, this after C8 treatment, didn't do that with the last right mice. So um, <laughs> we, we did when, when we did our, our slice recording and it had no impact on extrasynaptic NMDA receptors, um, be, you know, looking at before and after TBOA. Um, presumably, not much because they also tested it to see if it affected function of NMDA receptors and it doesn't directly. Um, wild type mice don't uh, have, or normal uh, people don't, don't have a lot of extrasynaptic NMDA receptors. They're not um, activated very readily. They would be in a stroke. So if, if they're not activated, then, and, then the trip M4 is not going to be active open either. Um, 
unless it's open by for some other reason. But yeah, the coupling wouldn't be there. So, so I think theoretically it, it shouldn't, but that is something that needs to be tested. All right, Lynn. Uh, so we'll let you get back onto your life. So it's now 6 a.m. out there. That's right. <laughs> It's, a, it's actually a beautiful day here in Durham. It's uh, blue skies, will probably the high will be in the low 60s. Uh, I've never been to Vancouver, but I've heard nothing but great things about it. And your talk was just uh, stunningly good. Uh, it Thank makes you. my brain hurt to listen to all that great physiology and synaptic work. Um, and, uh, Thank you, and great to see you again, and stay safe. Good to see you, Rich. See you soon. Bye-bye. Uh,